Greetings and God's blessing. This is Father John Carapi with another episode of Weekly Wisdom. Just a brief uh, note to thank you uh, for tuning in, for subscribing to uh, our Weekly Wisdom uh, service and series. Um, we, we appreciate it. Um, all the many times we've been able to uh, come into your home, whether through uh, the internet or television or radio, we don't take that for granted. I'm very thankful for that. You are definitely our partners and collaborators in spreading the good news. Well, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, the victory of the Rosary. Uh, it's all tied in with Our Lady of Victory. Uh, as you know, the month of October is the month of the Holy Rosary. October 7th um, is the feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. Um, and those of you who know me and have listened to me over the years know that I have always tried to spread devotion to the rosary. Uh, I believe it's um, enormously powerful. Um, it's, it's the, as far as I'm concerned, the most powerful personal prayer um, that there is. So at this, what I consider a very decisive time in history, uh, the history of the world, the history of the church, the history of the United States, certainly, um, we would do well uh, to turn our thought, thoughts toward the, uh, the prayer of the rosary and um, Our Lady of Victory, on uh, the victory of the rosary. Um, Our Lady of the Most Holy Rosary uh, is a title that the uh, popes uh, have bestowed upon Our Lady. And uh, a little bit of the history of, of this um, uh, idea of Our Lady of Victory, the victory of the Rosary. Uh, in 1571, Pope Pius V instituted Our Lady of Victory uh, as an annual feast to commemorate the naval battle of Lepanto. Now this was one of the most significant naval battles in history. Uh, it, it was uh, a victory that was attributed by the Church, by the Holy Father, uh, to Our Lady. Um, as this uh, naval battle was shaping up, and it was a, um, a battle between um, uh, a, a league or, or um, uh, a group uh, of uh, Catholic um, uh, entities from various uh, uh, cities, um, uh, it, it began, this victory was attributed to Our Lady because of a procession uh, that the Pope uh, uh, led in St. Peter's Square. Um, the victory is, a, uh, is attributed to Our Lady because of this rosary procession led by the Holy Father. Um, the success of the, uh, what was called then the, uh, the Holy League to hold back Muslim forces from overrunning Europe. Um, <laughs> history has a way of repeating itself. Um, the Muslim forces um, back in the 16th century were intolerant of any other religion or any other way but theirs. And the radical Muslim forces today are really the, they're the same way. They're intolerant. Um, you don't believe it, look at the countries where that radical Muslim rule is established. Um, Saudi Arabia, uh, for one, and there are others. They don't tolerate other religions. And if they gain power uh, and have a majority of um, uh, power in a government, then they become totally intolerant. So th this is nothing new. Uh, in 1573, uh, Pope Gregory XIII changed the title of the, of the feast day to the Feast of the Holy Rosary, which we have today. But it was um, started out as Our Lady of Victory. Why? Because the victory of the Christian forces against the Muslim forces in, uh, in 1571 was attributed to the Blessed Mother through the prayer of the Rosary. Uh, this was a decisive time in history. Uh, the Catholic and Christian world was about to be taken over by the uh, Muslim forces, the, uh, the forces uh, of the Turkish uh, Navy. Our Lady of the Rosary is so important for us in so many ways. Um, the rosary is a weapon. 
And if you don't think we're at war, I don't know where you've been. Uh, and I'm not talking about wars in Iraq or Afghanistan. Yes, those are wars. War against terrorism, yes, that is a war. But the real battle is not against flesh and blood, as St. Paul says. It's against principalities and powers. It's spiritual combat. And that, the outcome of that spiritual warfare, to a very large degree, will determine the outcome of the battle we see unfolding in time and space. Um, there has always been a battle between good and evil. From the moment darkness entered Eden, there's been a battle between good and evil, between truth and lies, light and darkness, life and death. And so it is today. Uh, you know, in the United States of America, we, uh, we, we, we have a raging battle. Uh, and I'll tell you this, uh, the most important battlefront, and now the media won't acknowledge this, the average American won't acknowledge this, but uh, the average American doesn't have a spiritual mind. Now there's a nice controversial statement for you. That's a fact, though. They don't know their left hand from their right when it comes to spiritual things. The main battlefront is the battlefront of life, and you can't get around it. Listen, if you took all the important things uh, in society, and there are many of them, uh, taking care of the poor, the economy, um, health care, uh, those are all important things, to be sure. But if you added them all together, if you put them all together, they're not as important as the battle for life. Listen, I'm going to ask you a question, a couple of them. Number one, do you think a country that has as its formal policy, as a matter of law, the extermination of a class of human being, you think that that, that country can be pleasing to God? Do you think a country that's guilty of genocide, mass murder, do you think that country can be pleasing to God, no matter what else it does that's good? Can that country be pleasing to God? I don't think so. Listen, the Catholic Church holds, and rightly so, that life begins at conception. There is no other rational, uh, logical, or moral position. Life begins at conception, and science backs that up as well. That's not a, just a matter of religion. That's a matter of common sense and science. Life begins at conception. If you're Catholic and Christian, you have to believe that. If you don't, then you're basically a heretic, and you've separated yourself from the body of Christ. Life begins at conception, no exceptions. Life begins at conception. It's a human being from the moment of conception on. Abortion, in a single case, is homicide. The popes have said that. Pope John Paul II called it murder in plain English. Abortion is murder. A single abortion is a homicide. Then what, may I ask, would 48 million and counting abortions be? That's genocide. More than 48 million abortions in the United States of America since Roe versus Wade. Genocide, by definition, the taking of the life of almost 50 million innocent, totally vulnerable human beings. That's the law of the land. And, and why is there, why, why, how can they defend it? Well, a woman has a right to choose. Hold on. A right to choose what? A right to choose to murder another innocent human being? No woman, no man has the right to murder another innocent human being. Now that's in your face, clear as a bell, truth. And there are many who will not accept it. And those people are well on their way to destroying this country. Let me tell you something. All the economic chaos you've been seeing in recent times, all the chaos in general, trace it right back to the gross immorality, the legal immorality of the taking of the life of innocent human beings. Everything else pales into utter insignificance when compared to that. And, and, and we now have a presidential election. 
another one. Uh, well, business as usual. Uh, have, you, have you heard a single meaningful debate on this most important of issues? No, you have not. No, you have. Now, we all know one side stands for murder on demand. The other side stands for the defense of life, but you won't hear any meaningful debate on it. That's been excluded. You know, all the parties have agreed not to talk about that because it's too controversial. And so the country continues to skip and dance on its merry way to hell, in plain English. The government will not be able to do anything right from this point on. They won't be able to do it. Why? Because this is now a country which has basically rejected common sense, rejected ob any objective standard of morality, rejected the teaching of the church, rejected the fundamental principle uh, set forth in the Constitution, that life is sacred. Uh, <laughs> but they ignore it. And vast numbers of people continue to be blind to this. This is a real war. It's decisive. Uh, you know, they, they've uh, under, through a, a, a specious, fallacious interpretation of the Constitution, they say, oh, the church can't talk about politics. Well, the church can talk about morality, and morality interfaces with politics. And you know, if they say, we're going to take away your tax-exempt status, and the church is cowed by that threat. The church is worried by that threat. My advice to the church is spit in their eye. Give the tax-exempt status back to them. That is a horrible reason to compromise the preaching of the truth. Oh, we're worried we could lose our tax-exempt status. Tax-exempt status. Give it back to them. Have mass out in a vacant lot. Give them back all the hospitals, all the churches, all the buildings. All those taken together are nothing compared to the bold proclamation of the truth in season and out of season. We're at war, all right, and the very survival of humanity hangs in the balance. If you can justify the barbaric practice of murdering the unborn, you can justify anything. You, all you old people, you know, like me, you're next. You're next on the hit list. Because if you can countenance murdering innocent, vulnerable, helpless little babies, then you can sure enough kill old people. You can rationalize it. Well, their quality of life isn't good. Well, they're a burden on society. Well, it costs too much to take care of them. And then what's next? If you're not blonde and blue-eyed? You're on the hit list. There are chilling similarities between what exists now and what existed when Hitler came to power. Chilling similarity. Remember, Germany was in economic chaos after World War I. Oh, the people were poor. They were starving in many cases. Uh, they were desperate. And along comes Hitler. Along comes Hitler, very, very great orator. You ever seen any of the, uh, uh, the speeches given by Adolf Hitler? Powerful. Oh, the people were, were absolutely um, enamored of his ability as an orator. Uh, and you know what? He did fix the economy for them, almost miraculously. He turned around the economy in post-World War I Germany. But what, what else was part of his agenda? The annihilation of people. Genocide. Wipe them out, the Jewish people. You know, as, as, as has been pointed out more than once, you know, you read a lot about how the Catholic Church, quote, didn't do enough to protect and help the Jewish people, which that's not true, by the way. Uh, in general, um, Pope Pius XII did a great deal, and, and so did many religious orders and dioceses to 
uh, to hide the Jewish people, to protect them, to do everything they can. Now, but now there are others, by the way, and plenty of them who didn't. Individuals who didn't. Individual priests, individual bishops, who did not do enough to protect the lives of those innocent Jewish people. Uh, and history condemns them, and rightly so. And today, we have an analogous situation. Oh, you may say that's far-fetched. Well, if you believe life begins at conception, it's not so far-fetched. A billion innocent human beings have been murdered in the most barbaric way imaginable in the last several decades worldwide. Innocent children murdered. That's genocide. <laughs> that's what the Catholic Church has to believe. If we believe life begins at conception and a single abortion is homicide, you have to believe that. Now, some of you are wincing and you say, this is, a hard, this is hard to listen to this. Yes, it is. It's hard to listen to this, but I'm going to tell you the reality is hard. And it's going to get a lot harder if we don't start getting real serious. And I mean immediately. There is nothing more important than the defense of innocent human life. Oh, and we hear, yes, but you can vote for a pro-choice candidate for a proportionate reason. You know, we've heard that. That was a misconstrual of a generalized statement of the Holy Father. Taken in context today, in this situation, there is no proportionate reason for promoting genocide, which is what abortion on demand is. No reason for that. And so we are in a battle, a war to end all wars, battle between truth and lies, between good and evil, indeed between life and death itself. We better get it right. It's my personal opinion that if we don't get it right this time, it will be a quick slide into oblivion for this country. No country that has as the law of its land the murder of the innocent can be pleasing to God. God is not a disinterested spectator in the affairs of man. And we better get that right and get it right real fast, like before November 4th, how about? We better get it right. There is no excuse for the perpetuation of this barbaric, practice of abortion. There is no proportionate reason for electing someone who promotes and defends a woman's right to choose to murder an innocent human being. No such proportionate reason, no such right. And if the Catholic Church can't proclaim that publicly, full-throated and unsparingly because we're afraid to lose a tax exemption, I'll spit on the tax exemption and trample it in the dust. And then let it, let whatever comes, let it come. Money's a lousy reason to fail to proclaim the truth. We better start praying. We better start praying the rosary every day. Padre Pio, among other saints, considered it a great weapon against evil, and that's what we need, a powerful weapon. I've always said, pray the rosary every day. You know, I, I've been asked well, if you could just say one thing to the faithful, if you could just give people one piece of advice. Now, I, you, there are a lot of things you could recommend that would be excellent. You know, by all means, read the Bible every day. Word of God is powerful. By all means, go to Mass as often as you can. Receive the sacraments. Absolutely. But that's not what I say. If I can say one thing, I say pray the rosary every day. Because if you do that, that will bring down graces on you, which will facilitate and enable you to do all those other things that we need to do. Take up the weapon. That's what Padre Pio used to call the rosary, the weapon used to yell out to the brothers, bring me my weapon, bring me my weapon, weapon against evil. And I submit to you that there is a lot of evil that needs to be fought today.
my brothers and sisters, every one of us has to be engaged in this battle. You know, you can't sit on a fence anymore. You can't pretend there is no problem. And by the way, every one of you listening, you have an obligation too to spread this to other people, to get other people to pray the rosary. Uh, have a rosary in, in your home or in your parish. Um, in the parish that I grew up in, I don't know how many years, maybe a hundred years, they've been praying the rosary before morning mass every day for all that time. Um, it's powerful. And we need this powerful weapon today. I'm recommending that uh, starting October 27th, I, I, I exhort you, uh, do it every day. Do it every day, but especially let's make a rosary novena to Our Lady of Victory uh, beginning on October 27th through November 4th. Do not be duped by nonsensical arguments that we can't bring what we believe into the social order. We have a moral obligation to form our conscience and devote our conscience. Uh, as Catholics, you must do this. You, you, you can't put your Catholic hat on Sunday and then take it off on Monday. You can't do that. If you're Catholic, you have to believe what the Catholic Church believes and then live what the Catholic Church lives. You have to do that. That's a mandate. That's not optional. We have to do that. W what happens if I don't? You end up separating yourself from the body of Christ. So I exhort you, I beg you, please, have this, pray this rosary novena. You know, say the rosary every day beginning, say it every day of your life. That's number one. But especially October 27th through November 4th for this upcoming presidential election in the United States of America. Uh, if we fall asleep on this one, if we allow lesser things to take precedence, and by lesser things I mean the economy. Uh, the economy is important, it's serious, I feel bad for people who suffer economically, but that is no, that's the reason that allows the economy is, it, that's an effect, a consequence of this country's abandonment of common sense, reason, and proper morality. Continue to murder innocent human beings through abortion and you'll really see what happens to the economy. You think it's bad now? It'll crash and burn. This country will soon be unrecognizable. It'll be worse than a third world country. Why? You've made God your enemy. You can't make God your enemy and hope to prosper. And one of the best ways to make God our enemy is to murder his innocent little children. Now, this is in-your-face reality. Uh, it may sound harsh. It is harsh. It is harsh. The reality is harsh. And we are negligent and remiss in our pastoral responsibilities if we don't proclaim this from the rooftops. And so, pray to Our Lady of Victory. So many times throughout the history of the church, she has protected us. She has defended us. She has led the way to victory. Uh, I remember in, in the church in my hometown, St. Mary's Church in Hudson, New York, I remember often going into the chapel of Our Lady of Victory to pray. That was one of my favorite places in that beautiful church. Uh, I would go in there to pray, and, in, and that was a chapel with a, a beautiful statue of Our Lady of Victory, dedicated to Our Lady of Victory. And on the wall, one of the, the wall that you face when you walked in there, there were uh, little brass plaques with the name of every person who had served in World War II. You know, Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, Coast Guard, and so forth. Uh, many of them had stars next to their name. That indicated they were killed in action. Uh, how the people had gone in there to pray to Our Lady of Victory when we were faced with the dark and serious days of World War II. Well, we're faced with dark and serious days right now. If this battle for life continues to go badly, then what you can look for is the quick demise of the United States of America. The moral demise of a nation 
almost always leads to the ultimate demise of that nation. Pray to Our Lady of Victory. Pray the Rosary every day. It's a powerful prayer. Why is it so powerful? Because it's the prayer of the Gospels. The prayer of the Gospel. The prayer of the Rosary is the prayer of the Gospel. You know, you meditate on the 20 mysteries of the Rosary. Those are Gospel events. You meditate on those and interiorize them. You become one with the Gospel. What, what does the Gospel mean? That word means good news. What's the good news? The good news is Jesus Christ. As you pray the Rosary, you interiorize Jesus. You become one with Jesus. You actualize your potential as a member of the mystical body of Christ. That's why it's powerful. Uh, we've got to do that. The, the prayers, Our Father, Hail Mary, those are gospel prayers. That's where they came from. The Our Father, Lord, teach us how to pray. When you pray, you are to say Our Father. And the Hail Mary, right out of the Gospel of Luke. The Rosary is gospel prayer. The Gospel's good news, and the good news is Jesus Christ. Pray the Rosary every day. Interiorize Jesus. Be filled with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you will be a powerful force to be reckoned with in this battle between the forces of life and death. We must do this one person at a time. Every one of us has to do our part. And if we do that, if enough of us pray and pray intensely, pray the rosary every day, if you do that, Our Lady of Victory will once again come through for us at a decisive moment in history. God love you, God bless you, and goodbye.